Yeah, Corey. Yeah, you might need to pull it a little closer. Much closer. There. Is that, is that any better? That's they're using my outdoor voice, I guess. So. There you go. All right. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, got a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 All right. Consent agenda. The questions on that. Were, that was all pretty much laid out in the documents that we got. Move to approve consent agenda. Get a second. 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 All right. All in favor say aye. 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 All right. Consent agenda is approved. Okay. Council minutes from the last time around. Did they see any corrections, changes? Did see anybody? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. All second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Alright, so we're up to the public comment period. Um, so what I'll say is this is not for public comment, but don't worry about the annexation comments. Those will come in the next section. If anybody's got anything else they want to talk about tonight, feel free to come on up to the microphone. And so more than once, more than twice. A little louder, but we'll get okay. We'll get okay. I'll try. Um, article all through, we're looking for it. Um, block one. Um, had a question about special assessments, uh, the ones I just got passed, and I haven't been able to get a straight answer. And I know Frank is working in the monitor's been working on it, supposedly. But, um, I really think the special assessments, these are business debt that the citizens. Have to take on. They don't want the term. They don't want the percent interest rate for anything assigned to it. What really needs to come out from the city, I think, that would really help the residents is what the term is, what percent rate that was agreed to in the bond, and also when this can be paid off. When is the deadline to pay it without penalty? Because you know, as, as we were talking about this 2019 2 or uh, Roundabout piece. Um, this assessment uh, was only $460 for the average homeowner. To carry that out, I mean, you pay three times what it's worth. So, um, is something going to come out from the city letting letting people know when is the deadline to pay this special assessment? Um, as I said, I've reached out to the city staff. Um, they haven't really given an answer. They kicked it over to the county. The county said, well, that's really not the assessment. That's really. Um, the city does that when they get their bond and everything else. So, um, as I said, it needs to be put out there. What is the deadline? I can pay the release certainly, but the money does me better than my bank account than it does the city. So, um, does anybody have an answer today? Lucas, do you happen to know when that might? Uh, state law, state statute says 10 days. So, you should have 10 days before that interest will kick in. So, I don't know why the county isn't telling you that because they should know that. Uh, if you want to call me tomorrow, I have answers to all your questions. So just call or email my office, and I can help you out. Is there, is there, thank you. Is there going to be a message put out from the city so that other residents know that? Yeah, I'll work with Becky then. Uh, she knows, and then uh, she can work with Frank. What I'll add is, like I said when I spoke with you on Thursday, is that once we got a straight answer, we could get back with you. Um, we are trying to work with the county to find out if their software will allow 
a extended time to do that. And where we phrase the question is, can we not charge interest until the new year? That so gives people even longer. Save off of 10 days is what is provided. But I don't think there's anything saying it can't be longer. And that's why we're trying to work with the county to get that answer. Because if it works with their software system, then they'll be able to do that. That's why we're trying to get that answer for you. I, I agree. I mean, if it's an annual thing, too, then basically it should change yeah. every year. Right. Thank you so much. Yep. Yeah. Anybody else got anything you want to talk about? See? One question. All right. Um, I know Ross didn't make it tonight, so you know, deputy, but uh, they did get sent out an email. Um, basically, last month they had 164 calls for service, eight crashes, one reckless driving, five animal calls, four alcohol related events, 12 medical, 19 citations, 46 warnings, uh, no parking tickets, one parking warning, one drug related offense. Um, Basically, they had the 24 calls where deputies were uh, attempting to serve warrants and civil papers. Um, last month, we had a string of burglaries at New Home Construction along Lost River Road. Uh, the houses targeted in this instance were also were under construction homes, and no current finished or occupied homes were affected. So I know that happened right across the street from me. They did a pretty good number on those homes, so, um, but I haven't heard any more about that. So I haven't heard any more incidents in town. So. Um, I'll let Ross expound on that the next time he comes. And, uh, that's the report that I got. So, you got any questions on that? All right, we'll move on. Lucas, you got that one. Yes, uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. Uh, number eight, uh, what we have here is the city uh, proposed to annex uh, portions of Fraudette's. Uh, Westbrook and Lazy A subdivisions by resolution. The City Council uh, approved that uh, annexation resolution on September 21st, 2020. Then our office published published notice uh, in the paper once each week for two consecutive weeks on September 30th and October 7th, uh, 2020, uh, informing people that uh, the City Council will hold a hearing uh, tonight to determine uh, the sufficiency of any written protests uh, objecting to uh, the proposed annexation. Uh, the city has received uh, 41 protests uh, objecting to uh, that annexation. Uh, so the city council uh, can hear um, any of those, those protests tonight uh, if it so desires. Under uh, North Dakota law, if 25% of the annexation area uh, protests the annexation, the city council can either stop its pursuit of annexation or submit the matter to mediation. So uh, with 41 property owners protesting the annexation, that's 70%. Uh, so, so really uh, right now, the city council uh, has, has two decisions. One, you can either stop your pursuit of this annexation or two, uh, you can submit this matter to mediation. If the city council chooses to submit the matter to mediation, uh, the governor actually appoints a mediator, uh, and that mediator presides over uh, the mediation proceedings, and that's when uh, the city will have representatives there. Uh, members that were protesting the annexation uh, will be, be a part of that uh, mediation committee. Uh, the township can have a representative, the county can have a representative, uh, and the uh, again, the governor's uh, appointee is the one that presides over that and sets that. Uh, that mediation proceeding. So tonight, again, the city council uh, can hear any uh, protests if, they, if they'd like. The city staff already uh, determined that uh, 41 of those protests were sufficient, so the, the percentage is there to protest the annexation, uh, but those are the options for, for the city council tonight. Okay. And so uh, there is a staff report uh, which was included uh, in your packet uh, staff's recommendation uh, is to approve the staff report and direct uh, staff and the city attorney to submit the matter to mediation. Okay. All right. Um, we had, I think one of the other things you <coughs> talked about tonight, too, is uh, the township has made some uh, statements about this as well. 
Uh, I know the township chair is here tonight. Todd, would you like to say anything on behalf of the township on this uh, matter? Yeah, I think so. <clears throat> and residents of Portis as a township. Someone one second. I don't know. Do you know which button I could? I don't. Thank you. Thank you. Um, residents of Horace, um, we at the township, and I have a couple other supervisors here with me, Kevin Bifford, who is our road supervisor, and Renee Clausen, who's our second ranking, uh, longest serving uh, board of supervisor. Um, we have dealt with Wall Avenue for several many years. We are totally befuddled, cannot comprehend, don't understand why the people who are affected, my phone has rung countless times. I'm sure the other, su other supervisors in the township board have gotten complaints, calls, issues of concern. We don't understand why people are protesting. Um, we at the township, we are given the responsibility of taking care of rural roads. This road is behaving in every sense of the word like a city road. The traffic volume is way too high. The speed that people are traveling at is way too high. And the hazards that go with this road, pedestrians, children, bicyclers, you name it, is way too high. We are not given the authority to pave roads. If you protest this annexation, you better not be one of the people calling the township for help. We don't have the budget, we don't have the authorization, and we don't have the manpower, the time, money, or any other resource to give a road with this type of problem the attention that it requires. This summer, my phone rang off the wall. The dust was so bad. Why was the dust so bad? People were traveling way too fast and there was way too many cars. And the complaints came to the extent you need to do something about the dust. If my kid is bicycling and falls off his bike, the next car won't even see him in time to stop. Okay, this is a safety hazard. For the township, it becomes a liability. Uh, Mr. Bifford made the choice, we gotta put some dust control down. We put some dust control down, it helped. Then we got some an early snow. I don't know that everybody understands this, but the 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 the, the the agent they put down for dust control does not mix well with water. In fact, it really inhibits the ability to drain water. We knew this was a hazard, but we did it because the dust was so bad, we felt we were between a rock and a hard place. We were just praying for a dry fall. We got an early snow and our number was up. And now I was getting phone calls because the slop was so bad, the gravel was ugly, the, the washboarding was so bad. Why was it bad? If you understand how washboards are made, it's by repeated cars traveling in the same fashion, time after time after time again, and usually too fast. And that is what causes washboards. We, we don't have a lot of options. 
All I can say is that if you are protesting this annexation, you better damn well be happy with the country road you've got because it's going to stay exactly what you've been experiencing. We do not have the resources. We do not have the ability in any shape or form to improve it. Your only solution, your only answer is going to come from the city. And I have to ask myself, do the people, the residents that live out in this adjoining area, you wanted to live close to the city. Did you really think you someday wouldn't get annexed? It's, it's a natural, logical conclusion. You don't get anything for free. And I'm saying if you like the road the way it is, then protest and, and maintain your independence. Unfortunately, this road and this subdivisions that surround it, that use it, this is your only primary ingress and egress. We really do not have too many other choices. And I guess I encourage you to support the annexation. Yes, it will probably cost some money, but you know what? Someone's going to have to pay the piper sooner or later, and it might as well be before somebody gets hurt. Um, from what I can see, the, the, the course that we're charting, someone is going to get hurt. It's just a matter of time. And the road condition, the dust will continue. Um, the weather, nobody can control, but there's just too many people using this road in a city fashion, we can't help you. And that's the sad truth. I'm not proud of that, but that is the situation that we're dealing with. And um, I think it's just a matter of time. And a prudent person would say, let's annex before somebody gets hurt rather than later. And um, I don't know if Kevin, Renee, do you have anything you want to say here? I've tried to cover it as well as I can. Any questions, any comments? I would be happy to field any questions, but I think I've, I've done my best to just explain the whole circumstance. And uh, with that being said, go ahead. That would be a question for the city. I. Well, the surround, if you're not part of the city now, you are by default part of the township. Okay? And, and I represent the township. And the portions that they're considering annexing, I, I didn't choose that. I would like to say everybody uses that road, but they had to make some decision as to what was practical to what you know groups of houses get are up for annexation. I'm going to guess probably so, but I don't know. I don't know because I don't know where everybody lives that called me, but I had a number of calls. I got to believe there's a couple of them in there. Well, that is a tough call. What we use for enforcement is the Sheriff's Department. Well, for the most part. If you can, if it's passable, it's a viable road. And and I'm not. Anybody else? To be very honest with you, the, the groups of houses, the developers that have been selling off they have worked with us to some extent, but we maybe weren't up to speed with how many of these, and they were all ganging up and using the same roads. Uh, we, perhaps through our own 
deficient attention. We're not paying attention, and we got a problem now. That's that's where we're dealing with. Would you say that there was no plan? The township is not really not really in the business of planning rural. The problem we have here is you've got people building like they're in the city, but they're not in the city. There's the problem. Unfortunately, I mean, this might be a question that the legal counsel can field, but um, from my experience, the developers develop a group of houses, sell off the lots. Once all their holdings are sold, I don't know that they have just very many responsibilities in most cases. That is true for a portion. Um, the city owns a portion of that road to the, on the south half, and the township owns the north. And the problem we have is, unless you own both sides of the road, either jurisdiction can't practically proceed. For the city to go ahead, they can't uh, assess anybody who's not in the city which means they only got half the people to pay for the project that benefits everybody. Being treated as a separate entity right now, they're an agricultural space, so we have to keep them, they have to work with them differently right now. So, yeah, and the road is like what Todd was mentioning for from the west up to where Fox River Road is, that is township. There's about a 50 or 60, that's about a 100 foot stretch in there where both sides of the road are owned by the city. And then the north side is owned by the city and the north side is owned the rest of the way. Besides the fact that I have a lot of questions, one question which I practical matter, no, we do not have a mechanism because the road is being abused, used, and just plain gravel roads were never intended to handle this many cars per hour. I mean, that's so the there's no legal mechanism by which the township can give control of the road to the city, and then that would forego any annexation needs. The township would be happy to give the city this road. It has been nothing but a headache for us that we have do not have the resources to handle. Has that option been explored? Has that option been explored? Yes, it has. We we have we have looked at every option we can find, and it really we just aren't equipped. We are we are equipped. We're mandated, and we are. Uh, governed, we're financed, and we have equipment and responsibility for gravel roads. The traffic that is using this road is not appropriate for a gravel road. That is not an option, unfortunately. Why is that not an option if all the parties are willing to do it? We just, we can't. Our legal counsel has told us that we can't just give the responsibility away. The only way they can get that road is to be part of the city. So why, why can't the city just annex the road? Then who, I mean, so what then? The people that are currently going to be using it, like Westbrook and Lazy A, don't have any responsibility for the road at that juncture? I mean, come on. We're going we're gonna to pave it. I mean, everybody's got to have a fair share in here. Yeah. 
to be on the west side. So I think it's just the Lost River. So Anybody else? Thank you. <coughs> okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to open this up for debate. Um, one of the reasons, you know, again, we're kind of at that point right now where we've got enough folks that done over 25 percent so right now this is probably going to go to mediation and probably we're going to be repeating some of the conversations at mediation um but you know if anybody's got some things that they want to talk about with annotation feel free we'll take it from the decision if anybody's got anything different we'll keep going so whoever wants to talk first go ahead so my name is james Plaker, and i'm at all the orchard and uh his, his comments all made it crystal clear that this whole thing is about the gravel road, which the orchard is not on. We don't drive on it. We don't go on it. We have no need for it. And that's what this is all about. So given that fact and the fact that 100% of the people in the orchard protested this, I want the council to explain to me why is it imperative that the orchard be annexed. Because the road on the east side of the bridge is going to There's nothing in any of your, your staff reports, any of your justification for this that mentions anything about the east side of the road. Everything that's in writing, everything he just said is about the gravel road. And given the fact that what you can do after you annex us is you can force specials on us that could force people out of their homes. And I want you guys to explain to me why that's imperative and why you just explain again that the road east of the bridge is going to have to be redone. Okay. Fine. So and we're thing. not about trying to get something for nothing. We would be more than happy to pay for that road so we do drive on it. Right. But at the last council meeting, when Mr. Schmidt mentioned how he's going to have to get water into that development as soon as it's annexed, who's going to pay for that? That was, no, that, was, that, was that was misinterpreted. No, the it wasn't. ability for what. You're already you're already served by a well today. And you said we can't have a standalone well out there. Oh, yeah, you didn't know what the meeting. Okay, well then I misspoke. Well. We should not have a standalone well out there in the city that we have to maintain and we have to worry about. So I misspoke then. If that was if that was message you came across and I said that incorrectly. There are other developments within the um, community that are annexed with their own wells, and I think we um, from what I we talked about and. Um, I think maybe the big question is them wanting to know about keeping their sewer and water and what that looks mm -hmm. like. Because I think when you talk about the big assessment, what people are worried about is numbers they've heard about being hooked up to city sewer and that costing thousands of dollars. Tens of thousands of dollars. Right. Yeah, but tens of thousands of dollars. Per house. But again, the city is not going to be forcing anybody to hook up the water as long as the wells work. They're thinking sewer. They work. But why, why would we trust that? Because you sat at a meeting three years ago and told us the city wasn't interested in annexing property that didn't want to get annexed. Because the road was an issue then. Now the road's an issue. All the way from Paul, all the way from about here, 17 up the road is an issue. Was why is there nothing, nothing in any of the documentation about anything except the west part of the road? Eric, do you want to explain that? Why is the name of the project on your website, the description of it, Improvements to Wall Avenue West of the River? Yeah, I don't know. I guess uh, from the conversations that I heard that, you know, that area, both on the north side of Wall Avenue and south side of the road, uh, are both our users of Wall Avenue. So in order to be fair and in order for this project to go through and to ensure safety of all of that travel on it, and adhere to our vision of our comprehensive plan, uh, we thought that would be in the best interest to include everybody uh, within that annexation. Best interest of who? Uh, every resident of the city and all the users of Wall Avenue. And how is it in our best interest? Because you use Wall Avenue. So, so why, so are you telling me that without our little dab of money, 
you could, there's no way you could do this project. Right, it's under the jurisdiction of Stanley Township. We want to do the no, whole corridor. Our, our, where we come out onto the road, it's not. But how do you justify to the other residents in the community that have to pay more? Even, even if it's a small amount, I guess it depends on who you ask, but how do you justify not annexing and them paying more when some people don't even have to use Wall Avenue at all, but then they still have to pay for it? Well, I didn't say that was fair either. Now, everybody that lives on the west side of that bridge, Lazy Acres, Drove out there on a gravel road, looked at their lot, figured out the specials, drove back home on a gravel road, sat down and decided they'd build a house out there. And now they don't like their gravel. And they want us to help pay for it. That's the bottom line. Plain and simple. Jim, you want to explain that project? So what we're going to do with Wall Avenue? What's understood? Planning improvements from the four way stop. West past the third entrance into Lost River. Right. That's what we are talking about. That's to be breaking up the couple of we sections. Have potential for three phases. One right. was between the Shine River and the four way stop, and then out to Lost River in the, the first entrance, which is the river's edge in Lost River. And then the third phase would be going out the rest of the way to the uh, right away line of the diversion. Each of those would have a special assessment district that's different. It was proposed with one special assessment district, and then the project would be split into three sections so that the cost would be divvied mm -hmm. out accordingly to the associated property. So the people on the west side of the river would pay substantially more than the people on the east side of the river. That's the way it worked out. It was preliminarily. I don't have numbers, they're all estimates right now, but we haven't even decided on the road we layout have, yeah. I mean, the COVID right. thing set that down for right now to figure out. But, so we don't, we don't need to start. Go ahead, Luther. And, and I'll just uh, address your concern with the, the water and sewer connection. Uh, it doesn't just need to be a conversation now, uh, based on the mayor and you having a conversation on, on that agreement. We can actually put that in writing during the mediation process, and we can have an agreement between the city and, and those that are being annexed that, that lays out terms that uh, both parties think is fair. And so there, there can actually be a written agreement uh, that addresses some of these issues, uh, if that is a concern. Yeah, it'll absolutely be in writing, for sure. Okay. I think there's plenty of other folks here that have things to say, so I will yield. Okay, anybody else still want to talk? <clears throat> I think what's going on right now Same is, name, so we know who you oh, are. John Coleman, <clears throat> need my address? Okay. I think the problem we're having right now, this is a product of deferring a problem. When Lost River was first discussed, I was at the, the, um, the planning, the hearing, the thing we were discussing where we were told that nobody would be forced annex into this, into the city. But we had to know at that time with Lost River coming in, that road was going to be a problem. And I think by deferring that problem to now, and that we'll deal with it later kind of scenario, that's why people are upset right now. And I'm upset about it. <clears throat> Obviously, I'm one of the ones that protested. One of the reasons is I could see this coming with Lost River. And I was upset at the time that Lost River wasn't taking the... Uh, responsibility of building the infrastructure from the city to the Lost River. This was inevitable that this was going to happen. I think it was handled poorly from the beginning. And I think right now we're in a situation where I don't think we can go back and say Lost River, if, without your traffic out there, this road would not be an issue. Is there a way to go back to the developer who's mainly, is the developer almost out, is that what I understand? Cool. So just to address that, I mean, the city has been in talks with the township for years on this road. This isn't something that just popped up this year. So these conversations have gone back and forth. The reason why the city hasn't done improvements to that road is because the city would be using taxpayer funds from the city of Forest to then benefit the township that's also using that road. And the city did try to partner with the township to create an improvement district to fund improvements to Wall Avenue. But as the chairman said from the township, it just didn't work. The township couldn't... Uh, 
set forth the resources to partake in that project. And so there have been conversations for years, uh, not four years, but for years, uh, trying to address this issue. And it's, it's not something that just popped up overnight. Right, yeah, I wouldn't think so because that, that road had to have been recognized for a long time that this was going to be an issue getting out the Lost River. And I'm disappointed that now we're at a point where <clears throat> we're discussing annexation when the responsibility should have lied on Lost River to get all that infrastructure out there, even though you're working with the county and the city on that road because it's a jointly owned road. I think the bulk of the responsibility for those improvements should be with Lost River because without that development out there, the road's a non-issue. And now the solution is to annex us into the city to help solve the solution. And I don't think that's right. So Lost River, if the city decides to go through with this project, Lost River will be a part of that improvement district. And so they will be part of the cost to improve it. What the actual assessment is uh, has not been determined. Who pays for the bulk of it has not been determined, but the whole area uh, would be included uh, in that improvement district. So they're not off the hook just because uh, that development uh, is in place. And so these are all, again, conversations that the city was having with the township, trying to get all the players involved that would actually receive a benefit from Wall Avenue. And it just didn't work out to do it through that uh, assessment method, that improvement district method. So the city uh, had discussions with the township uh, and the annexation method was the, the solution to this problem. That way, every person that's going to benefit is going to contribute to the project. Yeah, and I think that's another thing, though. We've got to have some numbers. I mean, to not have a preliminary plan of how that annexation, the cost is going to be uh, distributed proportionally to the homeowners there. Right now, we don't know what that cost is going to be per home, depending on where that home is located. So it's 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 just a shot in the dark to the to the citizens or the residents of these developments that are being annexed in. We don't have any information other than we're going to get annexed in. We're going to have to help pay for the road that we didn't cause the problem on the road. Yeah, well, one of the things too with the developer, I mean, even if he had done his part of the road, it was in the south side of basically where Lost Rivers at, because that's all the city. Can't do improvements on township roads. That's what I'm saying, though. You know, looking back now, wouldn't have been a better plan to, because if you had to know the development coming, it wasn't a surprise at that point that you own half the road and the township the other half. There's no surprise there. So coming into that project, I think that's when that should have been discussed and laid out how this project's going to look. <clears throat> and I mean, we could see it clearly when Lost River was coming in that this was inevitable. We were going to be standing here. Even though at that hearing we were told, or the public meeting, we were told that we'd never be forced annexed into the city, you know, here we are. So, here we go. Sermon over. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Hello. My name is Ann Del and I'm a resident of Orchard Park. I want to add some perspective. For everyone here to understand why the people of the orchard are so upset. Burdett's um, Apple Orchard has been in existence as a homeowners association and has its own water company for 42 years. 42 years. They've been managed well by the people who live there and they volunteer their time, they take water samples, they go through training, they have, we have our own water billing system. We have our own road, which was owned by the township and was paved by us, by the homeowners per property for $5,000 per home. We have our own road fees, which have been established that we pay to monthly. We have our own water fees that we pay monthly. We have no issues. We are well managed and we have very low administrative costs. As a matter of fact, you might say that our orchard is the perfect place to live because the cost of administration is less than $1,500 a year. That's $55 per home. Our water is about $110 every six months per home for a family of four. The road fees, $40 per six months 
per home. Our costs are low, our quality of life is high, and there's very little turnover in the orchard because of that. Most say our water quality is better than the city of Horace, and everything is well maintained. So if it's hard to understand why we are protesting this, it is because the road should have been paid for by the developers. The road should have been paid for in conjunction with the city and the township. Why were we able to pave ours? There's a problem here that was not addressed, but we, as a part of the orchard, are 100% against annexation because it is not fair. The way that you're going about this does not treat us fairly. And we've already paid for our own water, our own roads, and everything is well maintained. There are no complaints. And we don't complain about the gravel road because we don't use it. Thank you for hearing me. Okay, anybody else? Mr. Mayor, Council Members, City Staff. My name is Stephanie Landstrom, and I'm here today to request that you reconsider your resolution to annex Orchard Park. For those that may be unfamiliar with the history of Orchard Park, I'd like to provide a little background on the uniqueness of our neighborhood. In the 1940s, Lawrence Fredette purchased the approximately 30 acres of land that is now my neighborhood and turned it into an apple orchard. Old newspaper articles document many people thought Mr. Fredette was crazy in his new business venture and they called it Fredette's Folly. However, he was successful in his adventure and grew and produced many varied varieties of apples and sold them to businesses and private individuals. In fact, in a forum article from 1972, it was noted that Fredette's Orchard produced 7,000 bushels of apples that year. In the early 1970s, Mr. Fredette decided to develop his land into a residential neighborhood, and Orchard Park was born. Many remnants of the old apple orchard remain in our neighborhood, including tall fencing, largely invisible today, that had been installed around the orchard to keep deer out, as well as apple trees that descended from the original apple trees of the orchard. In fact, I had one of the original trees from the orchard in my yard until approximately 2010. In keeping with the tradition of the orchard, many of my neighbors have continued to plant a wide variety of apple trees in their yards in a nod to our history. Lots were sold and homes were built. Several of my neighbors still live in the homes they built there in the 70s. Fredette's Water Company was incorporated with the state in 1978 for installation, management, and maintenance of our well and water distribution system. We are a 501c12 corporation. We remain incorporated to the present day. We are in full compliance with all of the applicable state laws governing the safety and testing of water distribution systems. We have elected board of directors for our corporation. We have a homeowners association that manages all of the needs of our neighborhood. We have our own covenants. We file our yearly corporate tax statements. The road into our development is a township road, but it was the property owners in Orchard Park that personally paid to have our road paved, and we continue to manage and pay for the roads, updates, and maintenance. I've thought long and hard about your intent to try and force annexation onto our neighborhood, and I failed to come up with even one benefit that Orchard Park would derive from your actions. The only thing I can come up with are detriments. You state you wish to annex us to promote the health, safety, and general welfare of the city. Well, how about some consideration for the people you are forcing annexation on? Are we not entitled to our own general welfare? Honestly, I think Orchard Park has done just fine taking care of its own health, safety, and welfare. I could go point by point through your staff report that outlined your supposed arguments for annexation, but I suspect you already realize many, if not all, of the so-called benefits you list in that report as beneficial to our neighborhood are in reality detrimental. I get the distinct impression that you don't care though about the reality that there are no benefits to us being annexed. 
you see us as a means to an end, and you, at least so far, seem unwilling to acknowledge the major financial burdens and upheaval you will cause to our neighborhood in your pursuit. Much of your arguments and reasoning focus on your desire to pay wall to pave Wall Avenue and your conundrum that the township will retain still retain some ownership. Um, and I do understand from uh, comments tonight that it is true. Um, in your staff report, you said that Wall Avenue wasn't paved was paved the entire length of the corridor except for the portion under the jurisdiction of the township. The map seemed to imply the city has jurisdiction over the entire portion west of memory lane to the entrance of the horse park. And I think that was discussed tonight, that is not accurate. Um, in your meeting, you specifically discussed that portion of the road and stated that it was half and half of the township back on October 21st, 2019. Your staff report is inaccurate in that regard. If your assertion that you need to annex properties adjacent to wall in order to gain control of wall is true, it's confusing to us why the horse park property is not involved in the annexation process. You do not currently have control if you annexed us from everything west of memory lane to the horse park or the diversion road. The road into our neighborhood isn't even adjacent to the area of wall owned by the township. You don't need to force annexation on our neighborhood to fix your wall avenue woes. And on an aside, I'm all for growth of the city with the reasonable caveat that those that wish to pursue the growth pay their own way. The cost of growth should be shouldered by those choosing to grow. It's hard for me to understand your logic of forcing us into the city just for the sake of the growth of others. It's unfair, and I'm not interested in subsidizing that. We have an ask for annexation, and we don't want it. We have no desire or need for any services in Orchard Park. This under undertaking of yours is not the same as annexing undeveloped property for future development. We are already developed. This undertaking of yours is also not the same as someone deciding to build a house and picking out a lot they could afford along with the associated specials. This is forcing existing residents into a city and then forcing onto them increased taxes and likely special assessments that only benefit the city and those developers in new homes that want to build and do not wish to pay their full share of the specials. We do not wish to just be our open checkbook to you and ask how much. Orchard Park has been a good neighbor to the city of Horace and its good residents since the 1970s, and we would like to remain that way. We've done nothing negatively to impact the city. In the end, this will just be unreasonable financial punishment to Orchard Park residents. I would ask you to have some consideration for us as property owners. I realize this public hearing is likely just a box or checking off your list, but I respectfully ask you to reconsider your decision. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take one more. Anybody's got anything they want to add to this discussion tonight? We start repeating ourselves. Go ahead. Uh, Drew Rutherford, member of Westbrook Drive. Orchard Park, I say, well done. <laughs> I'm not going to repeat any of the things that they mentioned, but I'll add just a few of my own. So when the development, Lost River, was first uh, proposed and platted, several of us came out uh, to, against that. And there were three motivating reasons for that. One was just a general, we moved out to the country. We didn't want to be part of a city. We wanted to have the open spaces and enjoyed the 80 acre farm that was directly behind us. Uh, the two other pieces that really concerned us and were brought to the city council at the time was concern of directly about the road, whether the road can manage all of the traffic that would be out there. So as has been stated, it's definitely not a surprise that the road is getting tore up. If you go back into your notes, if they were well taken, that was a really big point of discussion, was the condition of the road with that increased traffic. The other piece was related to the bridge, whether the bridge could handle that type of traffic. So those were two big points of contention, even back in 2016 or 2017. So again, here we are. I don't want to dwell too much on that. I agree wholeheartedly with pretty much everything that has been said here. And uh, I really thank the township for coming out and explain some things for us. That was uh, for those of us in the Westbrook community, 
Uh, there are, I think, 14 plots in there. And some of our concerns are slightly different than the Orchard Park, uh, namely those of us who uh, already have rural water, already pay electric, already have garbage picked up. Part of the question would be, if we were to be annexed, how is that going to be managed? Do we then pay the city for the same services we already had at an upcharge for administrative fees rather than pay Cass County Electric or the waste management directly, probably for a reduced rate? So that'll be something to talk about. Right. The electric bill is going to change on those, on those garbage. The only one, my understanding would be garbage would be on the city contract. But we would probably, during mediation, want to talk about that and have that writing that we would just continue to pay that yeah. directly. Well, we don't, the city doesn't have jurisdiction if you're already getting water from Castro Water. We are getting Castro Water. Yeah. So yeah. then, so. then there's, there's no jurisdiction for the city to, to provide water services. So the only service that you would get from a utility perspective would be the garbage pickup. The city's boundary stops at the river for water service. So it would be cast rule is one of the and east of the river is more. And then cast rule electric also would electric, service it. We have electric, we have no no electric. Yeah. Or, or gas. Yeah. We are not providers of those. I still am a little bit at a loss as to why, if the township is willing to see the road and the city wants the road, and all parties want that to happen, why there can't be some workaround to just take control of the road, both legally and sort of administratively, and then you don't have to annex any properties. And then we could talk about the contribution for each of these properties just for the road, and then not to be involved with any of the specials associated with the, system, uh, with the city. I mean, certainly- I don't think that's an option, do I, Todd? I think you looked at this legally too, and I think we have too. That's not an option. They can't just cede the road over. I have to down. believe there is an option. There's always a solution if people are willing to pursue it. I, I just can't be. I just can't be convinced that you couldn't find the governor to say, "I don't want to deal with this mediation. Just give them the road." He signs a piece of paper, executive action of some type. I have to believe there's some action that can be taken. It's going to be hard to. Convince me otherwise. Okay. Not that it's not aware maybe of not a headache, but yeah. I have to believe it's possible. So, in I believe February, uh, those of us in Westbrook Edition were part of a tax jurisdiction for a park that was going to be built in uh, new development, which we didn't want to be part of. And we were somewhat put at ease that we were told that we would never have to pay that until we were annexed by the city. And there was some sense that we would not be forced into annexation. So that's not something we were going to be worried about. So we lost that battle and were included in that tax jurisdiction. So to be annexed will be to include between twelve and $15,000 to pay for a park we didn't want. So of course, that's part of the protest that we would have. We wouldn't want to be party to paying for a park for development that should have been paid for by the developer. And now that we're part of the city, then we would be part of that tax jurisdiction. And if you're wondering about the numbers, I just used the numbers that you guys provided for how many houses would be part of the tax jurisdiction. Took the number that you had for what it would cost and just divided it. it was between, you're talking about Meadowlark Park? I don't know the name of it. It's in the up Yeah, I, I'm not sure if they had those. Do you know where those boundaries are you to? We, we're in Westbrook's not in the boundary. Yeah. It's purely Westbrook right now. And I think it was like 3,000 or. Something. Yeah, around three thousand. We're in the boundary. You're not anymore. How did that happen? I was at the meeting where you voted. Revised the uh, special assessment district boundary. When did that happen? We couldn't. When it was, was determined, we it was an error that you were included in the first place because you aren't in the city. Right. So it was caught at the next meeting. It was because you moved from that. So it's strictly Lost River. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. All right. Well, thank you for your time. We had that from the park board. Park board separate from the city. Okay. Anybody else here? One more. Okay. I'm Davis Ladle Mills, and I live in the orchard. And I agree with everything that's been said. 
up to, to, up to now, and I don't want to repeat it. But at your last meeting, you included the orchard in a water improvement district. Okay. Is that contingent Jim, on being annexed? Jim, you want to go ahead and explain that? The happened. city is, pro is planning for a water improvement district throughout Horace proper, which I consider Wall Avenue down to uh, through Liberty Lane, through Arrowwood, then uh, Nelson Drive west to the river. And as part of that project, we are taking everything into account for the future. If there was ever a chance that something would happen with the well on the orchard, we have to think ahead and provide a planning to get water to the orchard. It was something that we thought was important if we're going to go through the motions of redoing the water in that area was to make provisions for extending that water service out to the orchard at that time. And that would be extending it to the orchard but not into the orchard. It, it would depend on the severity if there was an issue with the orchard. If it was just a well and we just needed to provide water, that we could, we had to replace lines due to a break or multiple breaks or something, it could be done. But the plan was just, the plan is, and the project is just in planning phase right now, <coughs> to provide an option to get water, city of forest water, to the orchard if there was a need for it. Would you be sharing that information with us as you We are plan? preparing a public input meeting as we speak. And it'll probably be a virtual one where we're going to create a video that you can watch and provide comments on. And we'll let you know when that'll be posted. But we've been working on that, trying to limit the number of these large gatherings for <laughs> Not at the moment. It's just your property is included in the district. Doesn't mean you're going to be assessed. It all depends on how much benefit you receive. And it goes forward. It just depends on the benefit that you receive at this moment. Water project? Uh, I mean, not that I'm aware of because no. City of Horace's water user area stops at 100th Avenue, Cook County Road. Mm -hmm. It's not benefiting the people at this point, but they were told they will in the future. Okay. And that, that was a previous project. Yeah. But were we going to be in the same situation? Like I said, the project is just in planning. We don't have anything engineered. To provide water to the orchard at this time. <coughs> Purely planned. If there is benefit deemed for the orchard, and there is the opportunity for going through that process to protest that deed. We're not quite there. We are there yet. Yeah. Right. Like I said, we're just planning that project. That's how energy runs a gas line by your house. My name is Joe Gregg. We live in the uh, in the uh, Apple Orchard too. And I'll just make this real short. If this were a referendum on this plan, three fourths of the people who were involved in it voted no through their protest. So that tells me it's time to go back to the drawing board. Don't this whole idea that really not anybody's advantage who would be affected by it 
come up with a better plan, come up with some numbers for people, come up with some justification, maybe even give the people a chance to vote on it. So you guys, you're the city council, so you represent us. We're all here saying, we like what you're doing. So let's have a different kind of a plan. Else. Yeah. So, my name is Todd Mazzell. I live in the Arthur. And uh, I heard your attorney say that you've been talking about this plan for years. Several years. I don't know how long. But we still don't know what it's going to cost, how much it's going to be, we're going to end up paying. What's the plan? You know, it's still up in the air. And Basically, like Joe said, what's the plan? How can you even think we'd want to be on board with you guys when there is no plan? We don't know what it is, and it's going to be a surprise. So, anyway, I want to know, Corey, are you a man of your word? Try to be, yes. Try to be. Okay. August 21st, 21st 2017, we had Orchard Park Homeowners Meeting Association. President was Wayne Rice, Vice President Becky Horsley, Secretary was Chris Holman, and um, the people that were there were Chris and Ken Holman, Kim Stokes, Pam Davis, Lena Mills, Dana Smith, Linda and Joe Gray, Stephanie Leal Lan Landstrom, uh, Denny McCarthy, uh, Susan Barr Bidenshay, Dan Hetland, uh, Mike and Deb Tellinghusen, Jamie Pfeiffer, myself, and Julie Dizelle. Ashley Johnson, Seth Ellard, and uh, Rich Horsley. And we had you at that meeting. Do you recall that? You were there, right? And we asked you several questions. And one of them was, if you know, how it would be determined whether we'd be annexed and how it would be approved. And you kind of described how that would happen. And then the thing you said, though, was, the city does not intend on forcing annexation. You said that. I did. At the time, I said so, I I think you should stand by your word. I said I, I think you should consider your plan. I think you should consider your plan. Come up with a good idea before just forcing stuff down people's throats. You don't know how much you guys are talking about spending on anything. You're talking roads, uh, city buildings, parks. It's just spend, spend, spend. You're looking for ways to get other people to cover your bills. And I don't like that. Yep. All right. Um, does anybody have anything different that they want to add to this discussion this evening? Okay, yeah, one more. I can also talk very loudly, so I probably don't need a microphone either. Come on, Linda, you got a little more. You got to talk first way, so. But where we passed on the Gray, and I live in the orchard with Joe, and I'm the budget director for our house, so you work with both that and I have money. Now, we're retired, we've been retired for a number of years, and this might bore the council, we don't always like to draw any decisions. But we're retired, and we live on a somewhat fixed income, not completely. And my concern is <clears throat> not so much the road. It would be nice to have that road built paved. All of us, I think, I would agree with that. We want to pay for it. We want to pay. But what worries me when I look toward the future is what's going to happen next? I mean, all of this development, all of this improvement, how far is it going to go? What's going to cost us? Can we afford to still live in that? Orchard or in forest. <clears throat> and that's my concern. Not so much today about the road, but what's going to happen in the future. Because you know, you can see it all around us. Forest is growing every day, it's expanding. And if we're next into the city, <clears throat> how much more of this development are we going to be expected to pay for after being established? So that's my concern for the future, not so much.
name is Myron Fusey, and I live in Westbrook, and I live right on Wall Street. Um, I just wanted to bring up my feelings, and I feel quite strongly that the city of Florida really allowed that development. They have a responsibility to the people of Westbrook Drive in particular and that area um, to give them back the quality of life we had before that development came in. Now I realize there's no way we can cut the traffic. There's more traffic noise. And I have spoke to the township of Miller about that dust issue. I saw um, one of my neighbor's kids almost get hanged over by a car because the car couldn't even see one of us. So we know something needs to be done. But I think you guys have a responsibility to find out a way, it has to be a legal way, to get that road paved. And it isn't that I don't believe Westbrook Drive should be a part of it. We should stay up there. But I think there has to be a way to come up with something fair to the people of Westbrook, fair to the new development, where there can't percent of the benefit for it and find a way. <coughs> I mean, we get taxes every year. If there's a special assessment on it, there has to be a way that we don't get in that. That's all I have. Annexing us into the city. Thanks, Mayor, in particular, you have the responsibility to find out about it. We definitely have work to do. You mentioned uh, the governor, governor giving us some kind of an order for it or something, but there has to be one. Or there's a will. Right. And maybe some of that will get found out in the election. I don't know. Try different avenues, and this is what we can No, I'm sure it's not a really easy. And also, I think we need to start to have numbers before we can see the dust being an X, before we know the big needs to fix it And I think you should have something about one time you talked about concrete roads and curb and gutter and bike bicycle paths and that. I mean, some of that's necessary, but. But that's been the problem, too, is that we came up with some options for that road and also to make it. We talked about cars being used and having bike lanes and all that right. stuff that we also did. Maybe we need to think of those. I'll try to come up with be the nicest option. Maybe that's a secondary, and I think we have a third option. The problem, like I said, we didn't get any further along with that, like we didn't want to see any sort of encroachment or something in the future that would be back for her. But it's to try to figure out, okay, what is going to be the cost of that so we get a little bit more of a hard number? We could probably have a range. Jim, when we talk about that, is there even a, like a range that we could throw as a number? I don't want anybody to get fixated on it because no. it is speculation like crazy right now. Well, you don't give you an idea. Road into when you cut the road down, because chances are you only want to come in and repeat it. You're going to have so much traffic every year. Right. That road's at least going to higher than that. Right. And it needs to be wider for this. So what if we go to the city and get a number on that? I don't remember what it was, but that was something we that night too. And yeah. maybe yeah. instead of like they were talking about having the green strip that's four feet wide or six feet wide and then it makes it wide. I think if you had a path of something there where you just had like a lane, a designated lane like they do in a lot of cargo for bikes, you know, obviously that part has to be done. That might be the second time that I responsibility lies with the city to take responsibility for making sure we do that. It has to be legal. Yeah, like I said, we would support it, but I don't know where I go. Well, well, thank you for your time. My name is Erin Hetland. I live up in the orchard. Um, I guess I have a question. It's like you said, it was just going to mediation. Do you think you've heard any that this week? Does that mean that you're automatically moving on forward with the annexation? Or Let the council decide that. Okay. Okay. That's what you said, so that's why I was wondering. If it does go to mediation, that's where that, some of that conversation is going to be going on there. Because before anyone spoke, you said it was going to mediation. That's why right. I was. Yep, it goes to mediation. Got to be moving on here. Okay, anyone else? Okay, Lucas, you got any more comments you want to make on this? Uh, no, as I said, uh, at the start of this, the council's decision uh, before you tonight is to uh, stop your pursuit of annexation 
or direct staff and the city attorney to uh, submit the matter to the governor's office for mediation. So my parents live in the Apple Orchard. I grew up there. A lot of faces that know me. And um, we're obviously going to vote on this tonight. And, you know, people might be maybe unhappy or mad at me for whatever stance that I have taken on this. So I just wanted to speak on that. And the big thing for me is if the water and sewer is able to be kept and maintained as long as it can that you guys want it and all that. Um, you know, I still go to my parents' house every day for work, but I live on Mickey Mouse Avenue and I have to pay everything that gets voted on here. I have to deal with the growing pains of a town that I grew up in and I have to take on special assessments and taxes. And the things that you guys say about not wanting to pay that is the same thing you hear from every single resident when we have to make tough decisions. Nobody wants to, you know, charge all this extra money for things, but in a city that's dealing with all this growth, and sure there's hindsight that we should have, you know, planned something a little bit more thoughtful. But that's, it is what it is. And people that are sitting up here on council are people that are donating their time to be here and to help. And anybody in this room can donate their time and anybody in this town can donate their time to help make better decisions if you feel that the decisions can be made better. And conversations about how can we do this in a way that makes sense for everybody, those are conversations that everybody up here does want to have as much as some people don't think so. We all live here too and we all care. And for me, and when I, okay, I'm, I'm living on Mickey Mouse and I know there's a special assessment coming for Wall Avenue. I know that road needs to be fixed because it's so unsafe for children. And I don't want to be the one to smash into a truck on garbage day or run over somebody's kid. And I know that I'm going to have to help pay for that road. And to me, how do you say to everybody else, like, yeah, well, we're not going to annex them. They don't have to pay what everybody else has to pay. It's just the way it is, even though they're completely engulfed by new development. And I know there's there's some unfairness or things that can be discussed, but as a whole, as a decision, it's to me, as long as the water and sewer can, can be kept, because I completely understand wanting to keep that 100% as a foundation of, of this annexation. But beyond that, I just can't see how it's fair. And that's all I have to say. Right. Yeah, the only thing I'll, I'll say is that if, if there was some misperception around providing city water and sewer to the orchard, that, that was completely insane on my part. So I apologize for that if I misspoke. But that is not the intention. There is water and sewer service at the road, at the entrance to the orchard that you know, someday, if if uh, if things conditions change and enough enough of you as residents have septic failures, where when that happens, you're going to be paying a lot of money for that septic replacement, and the state is changing some of the rules on replacing the septic. I'm saying would it affect you, but just realize that that the, the state is changing rules that we're having to abide by. Um, you know, as you know, as we work with other residents in the city that have septic systems, so. That's something that we are sensitive to, but there's no intention that we're going to force, you know, the orchard residents to have city water or sewer services if they don't want it. And, and nor do we do that in any other in any other development. They typically have to request. I mean, there's developments up north, Sunnyside, and other developments that we keep asking them. Do you want sewer service? Now you've got access to your front of your development. Do you want access? So far, at, at least the early surveys, the answer was no. All right, fine, we'll, we'll wait on that. And But now that attitude is changing. I'm hearing more people that are saying they want that because of the septic system failing. So, and, and, but that's up to you guys as residents to decide when that would happen. Really, the other aspect of this is you gotta consider um, not only maintenance on the road. I mean, Greg, you guys drive on Wall Avenue every single day. Yes, not west of the bridge, 
but you drive on Wall Avenue every day. And <clears throat> that road is not safe, even the east portion from County 17 to the bridge. I mean, just a little, a little over a week ago, I almost got ran over walking on Wall Avenue. And that's, I can't imagine having kids, and the more kids that come out to Lost River in this area, it's just not safe. And when we need that road needs to be upgraded for pure safety reasons. Um, so that's that's a that's a rationale for why it needs to happen. Is it more expensive? Yes, because the road was never designed for the level of traffic that it's getting. Now, could we, <coughs> looking back, could we have stopped Lost River? Well, that's really difficult to say. That's that's water under the bridge. That was a decision that was made a long time ago, and that was that developer that was, that made the decision what to do with their land. We don't get, you know, we, we can't tell them what they can and can't do with their land. So, the, so the services, the services we're providing there, right? And and but there's no intention that we're going to provide city and water sewer um, to the orchard at least. Now the city, there's already casserole water out to Westbrook. There, there's sewer line there too, but there's no intention of bringing that into the development unless you want that. <coughs> So it's bringing that backbone infrastructure, and it is, as Chelsea pointed out, it's a good point, but it's it's only fair to everyone else that you guys participate in taking on the cost of the maintaining and upgrading that infrastructure, because it can't be that way forever. It has to get upgraded, and how, that doesn't happen by magic. We don't just have a pot of money sitting over here that we can pay that and not special assess most residents. So it, it's a challenge. We got to we got to balance that. I think one of the big messages I heard was wanting to know somewhat of a cost. Have we as a city, the staff, implemented a plan that controls an estimate? Remember, we put a plan together. We're not the final say, kind of are, but we're not the special assessment board that goes out and says what the assessment is correct. We can sure put maybe a range of dollars on it. Is that something that instead of going back and going ahead with mediation, is it a chance <coughs> and say, hey, this is what we're looking at for cost. This is maybe what the city can contribute. Let's look at the whole broad picture and come back one more time. Yes, I would like to see everybody want to come to the city. You know, even though you're in your own development, we're all still in the city of course. Things cost money, we all contribute, we all use roads, we all travel, we all have parts, we all have share, we all have, you name it, uh, fire. We all need that, we all support each other. Uh, but I think if we were to give maybe a clearer picture, is that something that makes everybody a little more positive about? That would be a bad starting point. <clears throat> Don't know what portion of it you'd be responsible for. Well, we came up and said, hey, we know we need to go. But we don't know portion or if it's all the way up to the first or what's the most, but we don't have any idea. Well, obviously, we're concluding the more the merrier, the better cost it gets for everyone. So depending on how we can expand that, it's not been exhausted yet. Look fully at everywhere we can expand this road. We've had a public information meeting on this topic. We've discussed layouts, we've discussed potential costs for those phases with everybody. When that meeting was done, it was that we were going to come back to the residents with some other options, a menu. We discussed a menu at that time of what the potential could be. Then the pandemic hit. Been some back and forth, and we haven't gotten back out in front of the residents at the time of what we've gone forward with because we presented asphalt, concrete options, urban road, rural road. We've gone through all that. I don't remember what the date was. I apologize. I don't have it in front of me. But a lot of that has been discussed because I, I recognize a lot of faces from that meeting. And I remember getting comments from a lot of people, and I have comments from quite a few people on that project. So this isn't completely blind. I mean, we no, have. I we have a, a rough idea of, of costs, and I do say rough because we don't have the consensus of what we're doing going forward yet. But instead of getting through that process and having, having 
So all that range, I mean, they're estimates, I know that, but. Very, very preliminary estimates. Yep. We haven't bid the project, we haven't even, right. I know not there, but for the East half, um, right around between four and $5,000 per parcel based on an equivalent need. And that would be the area bounded by, on the north, Chestnut Ironwood on the south, Arrowwood, the river, and County Road 17, roughly four to five thousand dollars per parcel. When we look to the west, and this is the one where we really had some uncertainty as to what the typical section was going to look like an urban road, a rural road, asphalt pavement, concrete pavement, little gutter, whatever. It averages out more like eleven thousand a lot based on equivalent units. Very, very preliminary numbers, but Running it through a standard way we've done assessments like this in the past based on equivalent units. So basically, you get you're over an acre, you drop over two acres, you drop an acre. So you assess for one. You kind of get one for free, I guess. So, Jim, was that the, was the, the methodology on that one? Was that the half mile on your? Yes, side? and the, the district was like I, like I said, and on the west side of the road, it went from we had the, we went included on the north side was well on the river's edge, over to the diversion, down to the Cheyenne River and, and back to the mountain. So. At that meeting, there was no comment from the region. It was all one day. Everybody was mentioned. That's the first thing. I don't know if this is relevant, but I'll just tell this whole section for you. I live on Sunnyside Street. I'm on the east side of the road. It was the secondary or the second part of the development phase. It was built in 99. Half the sunny side was pavement, half of it was out, was on gravel. Same time that the road needed to be redone. Everybody gets all excited. I live on the gravel. I shouldn't have to pay for the up the north side. Well, I'm on the north side, why am I paying for gravel? You know, there just comes a time and point where the work has to get done, it has to get brought up, infrastructure fails. We've got to get it all on the same page. Wipe the slate clean. Everybody pays their fair share, and it gets done. And it's a great product. But eventually, it'll wear out again, and you have to do it again. I don't know if that meant anything to anybody, but I think that's where we're at. What's that? What's that? Well, and that's where we got to pay to other roads than just again private. So it's got to be what does everybody travel with? Right. And that is probably part of the discussion that we're talking about. You've got water and sewer. Got it today. But let's make sure that's incorporated in a plan for the future. Not going to last forever. The rules change. The state changes rule of stuff. It's not anybody else. Well, it's not us up here saying what you can and can't do. But eventually that will fail. So let's be prepared. Let's have the best map. You know, kids' transportation. Kids want to bike. Kids want to walk. You guys want to walk and go all over. Let's make sure we got a good transportation plan with it. So we're doing it in a safe way. And I was talking to uh, Kim. And he was saying that in in your guys' area is um, a lot uh, silkier soil, so the substrates tend to last longer and work better. And with the testing that they do, the, um, it's kind of what it boils down to. Go up north, they have more clay, and they don't last as long. And the health department doesn't allow them to be replaced because of, of the maybe it's a dust or something. Um, so. As long as the health department okay's it, and then you can continue to replace it when it breaks. And until the health department would say, there's no guarantees on it. No guarantees, but as far as putting it in writing, that's part of what it boils down to. 
Yeah, I don't know if there's a certain timeline on the well, but well, we're not we're not here to go I think uh, as far as the taxes go, when we looked at that, I think the average is going to be somewhere around seven fifty to eight hundred for the year. <laughs> yeah, that's not special. This is just a tax increase for the city. Um, some of the larger lots are going to be a little bit more than that, but the average that we came up, if I'm correct on that round. But so the seven fifty is the ballpark of around seven fifty yeah, is the average, average, and that's combined of how much. Uh, the estimate would be if a property was in the city was not combined like all your different taxes. So we were looking at how does park district impact it, how does city impact it, township would drop off. So we we're that, that's where that 750 comes from, just so you know where. I looked at the same thing, I actually don't think it's going to be That would be for the whole year, not for right, for the year. Potential is $4,000. We're not going to push water and sewer. Why would we? If it works, use it. Don't care. Don't care. Guys, don't care. If your water and sewer works, we're not going to interfere with that. Yeah. I think some of these definitions need to be looked at. Highlighted, whatever. What we're just using, I can tell you, I can send you an hour and minute second of video. Okay? You brought the assessment district for the internet, and you said, well, how come the orchard is not They can't be. They can't be. You couldn't be because you were in the township. So mm -hmm. there was not an option. You no. said, you go through the city and put them in there. The city will to put the orchard in there. In which one? Water replacement and the connection to Cabin Road. It was a preventative. I know. I didn't watch it tonight. No. Well, that's going to point out is the orchard. The orchard was put in there um, if there were <laughs> improvements done in that area for water service. Not saying that there would be, but if there were a, a orchard case, let's say hypothetically like, something happened to the well or whatever, and the orchard said, "Hey, your horse, we need water." Have the ability. For that within the assessment district. That is the reason why you do that, is and what they're doing is accounting for basically the horse service area. Because if, if the orchard was to give up the well, what would happen is their well, the service provider that you would have by default would be the city of Horse. So that is why the assessment district was what it is covering the orchard too, but because if we're, we're looking at what is the forest service area. That's that's the reason why the assessment district was did account for that area. Not saying that they would be assessed, but that there would even be impacts of that area for the project, but it was they account for the forest service area where those improvements are here. Okay, that first drawing of this I think there needs to be a clarification on that one. Because we are dealing with water, with life service, you have to have the ability to provide it. We also stated in that meeting after that meeting that I specifically stated that it was of use to us that we had to do a district. The reason we do the district is just as we said, the versions doing something like that is a last resort. Because it's dealing with water, we hope and other avenues for funding 
have our users pay for it versus special assessment. So that is a last, last, last option for the water. We need to keep the water in the forest, and that's why we have to put that district in place. So the intention is not to use any special assessment to pay for it. Because there are water funds out there, and there are other grants that we're going to go after to cover that cost. <clears throat> so we just need to make sure that we are taking into consideration that we're ready to provide service if needed. But we don't want to special anyone in the whole city for that one specific time. Enforcement part, if you just need to take cars with an emergency at our meeting. Now you're looking back to like the intention when it was done. I specifically said it in the meeting though because I didn't it want to have a district. That there's no plan. There's no plan. You're up here arguing about who said to include the orchard, who not to. There's no plan. There's no dollar amount. People have said there's an estimate, but don't take their words for it. That's not a plan. It's a mess. The code isn't bid out yet. We've got some ideas, and that's where we came up with the number. They don't bid out the road because they don't own all the road yet. Okay? You can't go bidding out on a road project when you don't own the road. We can give you estimates based upon what we currently have, but I can't give you a dollar figure that's that's a concrete one because we don't have it. I give you the range. Left to the developer who sold it and the people who built the house who built it. Agreed. That should have been the problem for the developer, the city, the township, and the people who bought the home. Okay, that was dumb. Okay, when did they do that? 2015? I mean, yeah. So clean up your mess what it's doing. You guys are just trying to clean up your mess. Any other comments on this, guys? Okay. I have one thing. This is all about money. You guys need our money. If you annex us, then we get to pay city taxes. Plus, now he's talking fifteen, eighteen thousand dollars worth of specials. So there's your money. That's the only thing this is about. All this other stuff, that's just frosting. But the bottom line of this whole thing is you need our money. We need help fixing the roads, guys. That's what this comes down to. Call whatever you want, but if you guys are part of the deal with the roads, you guys use the roads, you got to be able to have everybody, like you said, a fair share. Okay? That's part of the deal. We're going to talk about and say, okay, this is what's going to cost us. Months after people, whatever they can. Is there a way to find out what the road is going to be and say, hey, next year, but you would have to pay four thousand, five thousand, six thousand dollars a lot, and leave and leave go from there. Is there even a way to do that, Lucas? Not legally. We tried having those conversations with the township, but their attorney didn't want to go down that route. So that's, I mean, again, you know. This, these conversations have been going on for years and the city has been finding these projects for years. It's just there hasn't been a solution between the two parties and the solution was annexation and that came from the township. We don't want to jail now because we just paved the road and paid for it and just keep it. I mean, I've had a conversation with the township about time. Yeah. 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 If you don't pay to pave the road, we'll still maintain it. We'll push the snow off. So were you happier to maintain our road after we paved it? Or were you happier to move to That is an option. We could do that. We are not authorized to hard surface a road. Spending money by the township on hard surface a road is not something we are empowered to do. But if they pay for it, if anybody pays for it, we will still move snow off it. So there is a way of doing it. Yes. We do it today in the orchard. We we clean that road off. Yeah. And yet you didn't pay payment. We did. Yeah. No, I agree. It doesn't make it we, we get money from the county to maintain the right. surface of the road. Yeah, but so we paid it. So yep. that's what should be done with this one. Yep. Pay it. They'll maintain it. 
Do you have anything else you want to add on this? I guess my, you know, there's still a lot of questions about dollars and cents and that type of stuff. Okay. Is it something that we need to document what we have available at this time to provide to them so it's clear what you want to include or not want to include, such as you do not want to take out the of the year. Objective is, is that you are kind of surrounded by the city, utilizing city services, whether you use it or not, and um, this is what the team is doing, this is what we are going to do, this is what we're not going to do, so it's clear. But if we did that, what happens with, if, can we come back at another time and communicate this all to the residents and there's still no one, you know, still protesting that type of stuff? They'll be able to be communicated with that at that point, or do you have to make a decision tonight? You don't have to make a decision tonight. If you want to table it for additional information from the city staff, uh, that's an option uh, if the city council so desires. As far as a time frame of when uh, you'd have to pursue mediation, uh, the century code is silent uh, as to that. Uh, but, you know, we'd like to do it uh, sooner rather than later. But, I mean, if that's the direction that the council wants, uh, for city staff to, to get you some hard numbers or some some just additional costs, and that's fine. Okay. Is that something you want? Yeah, we would make a motion that we basically find a representative or a key representative from the area, work with them to say what are their concerns right now that we can talk to, communicate, and then from that point get their feedback on it. And it may be that in agreement or they understand more and it changes but I don't know what else can be done. So well, the goal would be to try and you know if 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 there's an agreement that we can come in to to with the city and the residents that can potentially remove the protests that would be the best case scenario. So I, I guess I'll second that motion. So so we go so we give a couple of weeks we have some their numbers. Just yeah. put some more definition on it for everybody. Yeah, we'll have to meet in the middle and just right. pick something to go forward with. Right. And we'll be coming down within two weeks, so in the middle of November, we should be able to put this, have this kind of conversation again. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, and then part of that, I think, is don't make the impression that this is how this should be. Like the road, or you're not going to just everything. How does how does project going to be chopped up at this point? Just for what price? But even okay, just so you understand, though, that's still subject to change. We can come up with something, but we don't. Nothing's been defined totally yet, so I mean, it could change. Yeah, we can come up with a full layout like that. We can use the same methodology that we've done yeah. this last go round. That was that was my point. Yep. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Help you guys out. My memory is a bit foggy about this, but when you proposed the solutions for Wall Avenue, probably about a year ago, there were several phases. The sticking point and where you guys left it, and I don't think they ever took it back up, was you were going to reconsider how the city does assessments, period. You were thinking that maybe the Wall Avenue corridor was a citywide project, and you were going to consider moving towards an assessment mode or model where certain things are assessed citywide versus having district. And then that's where, to my understanding, you ended up leaving it. You were going to see whether or not the fact is the conversation is still ongoing now as to which model we're going to. So it wasn't even just picking which of the three options. It was get a number you needed to know was this going to be assessed citywide or was it going to be the districts that districts that were being talked about? So currently the model that we are using is a half mile either side of arterial road, right? right? But we are talking about changing that if we go to some other model. We don't know yet. We're still talking about that because we have to look at this from now, say, four years down the road. Is that how we're going to do all these arterial roads? Or are we going to do citywide? Or are we going to come up with some other schema? Some of, you know, other municipalities use different methods. I mean, we can look at those a little bit more to see what would be more effective for arterial roads. So, are we 
our, our memory is the same of that. Just to add clarity to everybody who wasn't yeah. maybe there. Yeah. Yeah. talking about that. Mm -hmm. Again, it comes down to fairness. How, who is that road the most? Well, some people on the far half mile would say they never used the road. Where everybody's attached to it's going to be used all the time. So where's the fairness? So if you do a wide assessment on a wall, something like that, you got people who never use that road, ever. They're not going to come down this far. Just a mere and fair concept, too. As well, the gentleman in the back brings up the point about we need their money to do this road. Well, we also need money to pay for all the stuff you guys use as well. You know, let's keep in mind all the city expense that we have with what everybody uses. I mentioned that earlier. Let's I ask everybody to go home and think about that. Where do your kids go home and play? What roads do you go down? What does everybody do? It's all part of being in a community in a city. So I ask you guys to do that as well. All right, so David, second on that. It's all in favor of that, say aye. Aye. Okay, it's unanimous. Okay, so in two weeks we'll come back here. We'll have some numbers and get play out the set up a bit more. Yes, do we want to find out who the representative is yeah, and date suggests? Yeah, because you're right. There's that good. Say one question. One or two weeks of either of you guys, because this will probably be the last public meeting that we have, or if it is, we're going to scale it back quite a bit because of COVID. It's kind of sketchy territory right now, anyway. Really. But um, so let's try and do that. So why don't you guys let us know if you want to come up to the weeks here. If we get it earlier, we can get it out earlier. But you can let us know that, um, which ones you want us to do it. Um, go from there. All right. Move on to number nine. Then. Second reading of this ordinance, or no changes have been made. weeks here, uh, you'll see the water purchase agreement that was proposed to council. So that actual agreement with Casco, uh, with the working with Casco, we'll get that hashed out and it should be ready to go within the next couple weeks. Okay. I read that to the council, so if you want to just expound on over the basics. I don't have one of the uh, list I've been trying to prepare for this. It's just kind of last minute. I was going to go to the draw pad from uh, the I was talking about those. So, <coughs> a little basics here. I know uh, the mayor generally asked where the crashes were. I talked to the operator a couple of times. Just kind of clarify who is monitored up close. The dominant least crashes are all leading to the right around the whole thing. As far as the alcohol related calls, I believe one of those had been a DUI. Uh, the drug related call was going to be a DUI. Um, so, again, I'm going to see that department interacted with it. Um, if it was anything else, I don't think it was anything else. 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 I don't think
question I have for you was as, as they move further along in the investigation about their loss for Not so so many right now, yeah. but they're still active. I believe or in the I just thought that I had heard you say the question about the things that come up in the second response. Can I ask, do you guys ever patrol Apple Orchard, Westbrook, or any of the other developments? They, they yeah, you know, we're from the other side of the response to the tower on the water and the tower on the south. And how, or how is the Sheriff's Department funded? Well, we're going through the town, I mean, you guys are contracted with the township. I believe we're going to contract with you guys. I don't know. That's my point. Yeah. Uh, typically, uh, from my knowledge, typically the contracts are with the cities, uh, with sheriff's department. They'll contract with the cities, uh, townships. If they're covered through overall county presence, so if they do have increased presence and everything, they're you know, the sheriff contract with the city because they're in town already. Just the aisle, you. Um, you guys have you tabled that vote for two weeks from now? Yeah. Um, one thing I was getting at, we were seeing any, we, I was just looking at the numbers, I've gone back and looked. Are we seeing an increase in the number of calls you guys are taking? I just go back and take over the call. Yeah. Um, I'm not really sure. As there states that were for the hundreds of calls, the clinical calls, the clinical calls, the One thing I was going to ask you is that can we get like an end of year summary? I know we talked about this like one other time, but like sometime in your January or February, it might be right away, but just kind of like a summary of what I'm probably looking for numbers, probably more than anything. You put together a sheet that kind of shows you guys in the number of calls on a monthly basis. Well, I guess even if you just kept the monthly numbers and put it in the spreadsheet, a Word document that we can a spreadsheet. <laughs> Plan down there is a big uh, numbers junkie. <laughs> <laughs> I just think if we did a spreadsheet type of thing, that would just give us some more idea on how much work you guys are having to do down here and maybe justify taking what you're taking. Um, for those of you who don't start for Ross, my supervisor, the COO, they want to adjust that because I know for a second we can report tomorrow after the judge's vote on it. So I switched over to report similar to what you guys are using. But I would have a uh, view of staff that had all the numbers for the power types that we had there. I have a uh, copy of each one of the monthly reports. I can see them all. We can do that. Yep. That's fine. We can, we can create the spreadsheet. Just get kind of a spreadsheet format. That's easy. Yeah, as long as we get the numbers, I think. We'll see what we can do and see what we're doing with the spreadsheet before we're here. I know the sheriff's office right now is looking at doing more data analysis so that might be something. Great. The numbers, guys. So we can take a look at that stuff a little bit more. So, so one yeah. thing I was one thing I was thinking of yeah. is as, as snow starts flying, um, I don't know if you're going to be enforcing some of the overnight parking on some of the city streets. I don't know if that's been going to be a problem. And I'm sure there's a time frame here in November, December, where people forget that they're not supposed to park overnight on the street. So it's going to be something where we'll have to work in conjunction with the public works guys so that people aren't parking for the night, especially when school events or something is coming up and all of a sudden now, you know, we've got issues. So I don't know if there's a kind of a warning track, so to speak, where we warn people that, hey, you can't park overnight, but at some point we're going to start enforcing that because of snow removal, right? Mm -hmm. So we can not want to do for an hour when we go home and see people that are in my house and go to We're already attempting to do that. I just want to make sure we're proactive so when the guys need to get out there moving snow, that 
people aren't surprised, right? So some of you doing what exactly we suggested, so that's great. Perfect. Okay, thank you, sir. Yeah. All right, Barry, you got number 10. All right, thank you, Mayor and Council. What you have before you is the second reading of the ordinance amendment to alter the parking lot buffer from 10 feet to 5 feet. Uh, nothing has changed in the proposal of the language. Staff hasn't received any comments, and we recommend approval of the statement. This is the second reading, you said, right? Correct, yep. Nothing changed. Okay. All right, for this application, uh, the applicant, uh, New Horizon Homes, has submitted an application for zoning change for uh, Lakeview Heights Third Edition uh, for lots one, two, and four and block one. Uh, this is a similar application to what you saw a couple of weeks ago when there was an application for the same properties uh, requesting a zoning change from C1 to C3. Uh, that application never received approval, so the applicant has come back to request uh, yet another zoning change from C1 to C2 uh, for the same properties. Uh, staff maintains the same position on this application as well. Uh, our comprehensive plan, the 76th Avenue corridor study, we've kind of shown the County Road 17, 76th Avenue area as kind of our prime uh, commercial activity area of the city. So staff uh, really strongly supports this application in uh, basically increasing or, or changing the zoning ordinance to a commercial zoning district that would allow for more intense commercial uh, land use activity. So uh, staff hasn't received any comments from the public and uh, the staff recommends approval as stated in the staff report. Okay, real quick, this one was in relation to now that Name changes to the C, what we include in C1, C2, C3 right now. It's going, you're going directly to the Lake Bonnie Road, you're right, in terms of C2, right? Yeah, I mean, we, we would like C3, but C2 will also work for most of the, for the uses. Okay. Yep. And staff would also maintain, I mean, there's very little difference between C2 and C3. They're virtually the same thing with some minor differences here. Make a motion to We'll open up our public hearing on uh, rezones. Anybody got anything you want to talk about with the rezones? One, twice. Public hearing. Again, let's refresh our memory. Why did this, why the C2 better fit than C3? Uh, C2 has a smaller uh, minimum lot size requirement. Um, other than that, I mean, C2, C3 are, are generally pretty similar. In terms of permitted land uses, we've uh, removed minimum lot widths. Uh, we added professional office as a, a land use that's permitted by right in the zoning district. Um, I, I really don't see the difference between either C2 or C3. I think uh, it would be in the interest of the city to either allow for either uh, zone, uh, zone change for either uh, zone district. Right, and I think the city wants to have the they could put something very large, like a quote, feedlot or a very big box store or something. Mm -hmm. And I know that's not an intention, but they feel how C2 is more correct, correct for us? Kind of. <laughs> the, thing, the thing I pointed out was you can put a typing machine or an RDO, right. which is not what I'd like to see there, but. Uh, okay. So I agree with Barry, I think it, it, it would be fine to see it. I'm going to go through the process again. Somebody to ask me, but. I'd make a motion to approve it at C2. Okay, I'll make a motion to approve it. All right, here say aye. 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 <coughs> you got that one. 
Okay, this item here we're bringing up for discussion is uh, how water rates for unmetered, metered customers, uh, bulk customers, and commercial industrial water rates. Uh, to give you an idea for the charges for unmetered location, the primary and your primary type of properties this impacts are trailers. Uh, there, there's, I believe, one or two businesses that do not get their meters replaced or we were weren't able to get meters replaced uh, at their locations when we did our water meter replacement program project. Uh, the city has a building for that where we charge those properties 5870. That number hasn't really changed. That 5870 addresses water, sewer, trash, everything. Give you an idea, comparison, the average water bill uh, for metered service in Morris right now is 94.16. Good comparison out there. That's why we're bringing that up for discussion tonight. Uh, when you look at uh, typically the unmetered locations, like you mentioned, our trailers, overall average water usage across a whole year in Morris for customers is about 7,500 gallons of water. The average usage for a metered location for a trailer is around 4,500 gallons per month. When there's an unmetered location or a location where they're not facing it versus metered, metered typically you'll see trends where usage will drop down quite a bit. Reason why is because folks are more conscious of how much water they're actually using. Uh, so what we did is we had a recommendation for the council to consider where uh, we had based this off 6,000 gallons. The reason why is knowing that there is a drop in the amount of usage when somebody's metered because they're more conscious of it. Also because those unmetered locations typically are running water, especially in the winter months, all the time. The reason why is because they need to do so to help prevent freezing the pipes. So what we're looking to do at your recommendation or request for council is base these off of a 6,000 gallon usage for their utilities. And if those properties do not want to participate with that, they're more than welcome to meter install. We have meters for them. We can't get in the force those properties to install these meters. However, we would provide the meter, they would just have to have a licensed plumber come in and install that meter so we can get that done. Uh, if we base it on 6,000 gallons based on the new water rates that are approved by council effective January 1, or Jan on Jan in January 2021, then August 2021, we had two different rates to work ourselves up for the cash rule rate. Uh, what the average bill would be for unmeared location would be 112.80 from January 1. That's 6,000 gallons usage. And what it would be come August would be 127.50. So it does go up quite a bit, but like I said before, the average metered connection for a household within ours is roughly 94. Roughly ninety-five dollars, just under ninety-five dollars. So that gives you a comparison. Okay. Ninety-five for your company water. That's monthly. That's that is currently. That's not accounting what our new rate would be for that number. So that's assuming that the usage would be twelve dollars for a base with three dollars per thousand for water, and sewer was five fifty base with three dollars per thousand for sewer. Those rates do go up starting January 2021. So this number would be uh, probably closer around 120, 125 range if we base that off of the new rates that would be kicking in from January 2021. Okay. Well, I know Brian started the whole meter thing, and I know he probably explained to me why the trailer park is so They're getting into, the, getting into the property to install it. Well, it is getting in per trailer. Right. And right now, they, we couldn't find a contractor that even wanted to touch the project because nobody <coughs> wanted to do, do the work and take on the responsibility of putting a meter in because you need to have to put it under the, the, 
building and heat it so that all of a sudden it doesn't freeze up if it's outside the building. If it's inside, typically there is limited space where they would put a meter, so it was nearly impossible to, to make a space for those meters to, to be placed. So it, it's basically the point is it's it's difficult, right? So that's why um, we couldn't find a contractor to do the work that wanted to do the work. So therefore, okay, we had we had no choice at the time to stay with them as being unmetered. But right now we know that we haven't adjusted their rates. <coughs> Right, because we, we changed all the other rates for city water sewer, but we haven't adjusted the rates for the unmetered residents. So that's what we're trying to correct. How many other ones are there? For unmetered locations, we're looking at about 40, 42 in that ballpark. Some of those we can maybe get in at some point. Yeah, this is the intention is to incent them to say, okay, if you really believe you're only using 4,000 gallons every month, then let's put a meter in. And oh, by the way, we'll help make facilitate that. But let's get a meter installed at your building or place of business or whatever, and and then we'll charge you for actual usage. So the moment they get a meter in, and we can confirm that we actually can read the meter, then it goes leaves this model and goes back to the rest of the model that everyone else has. Yeah. Like yeah. 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 So. In, in, in addition to the unmetered, we also have bulk. Bulk, we currently charge six dollars per thousand gallons. Uh, our recommendation is bring that up to six fifty. Uh, the primary individual or users of this would be uh, construction industry. Rag when they come in, they go up to a hydrant, they fill up. Uh, also, we're encouraging our staff to be doing this again. Heat actual meters that connect onto the hydrant. So that way we get to read this because sometimes you'll see if somebody just goes up to the hydrant, like a construction company or something, they pull up a truck. They may be doing that based on an estimate. So what we're trying to do is get to a point where we evolve to where those are actually metered so we get a true usage, how much they're actually using. So the bulk meter rate, what we're recommending is to go from six to 650. Our cost for bulk meter uh, or bulk water We'll pull up when we have that connection to gas wheel. And then the last one for commercial and industrial, uh, our recommendation is just to keep those the same as residential. Uh, what you'll see in a lot of communities is about 50 50 of if they charge if they charge a little bit more for that water usage for a commercial property or industrial. Other communities keep it the same. But our recommendation is at this time just to keep that the same. But we have to adjust the ordinance to make it the same. It, it, okay, right? I believe it's still the same. It is. So we just want to keep it. Oh, okay. Keep right. keep it the same as what the residential property might be. So we don't have a different. We're, we're different not going to have a surcharge yeah. for commercial users. So I got a question on the bulk. What's our standard rate right now? So standard is six. Oh, not for bulk, but uh, sorry, for residential. Residential. Currently, right now, it is twelve dollars for a base and three dollars per thousand. Okay. Yeah. What's it going to go for a thousand? Okay. One, it'll go to fifty for a base. Right. It'll go to four twenty. And then in the end, it'll be and then come August, which is our target time frame to go live with cast real water. It'll go up. The base will be twenty seven, and then it'll go up to five forty, and that is nearing cast rules. The only difference that we'd have from cast rules rate to the city's rate. Is that we would still keep the seven sixty dollars sixty cents surcharge for capital improvements or capital for that? Um, we would still keep that, but that's because we have a lot of infrastructure projects that we have to get taken on and try to help cover that cost with the utility rate. So, in terms of the bulk, right now, if I were to use the power to service the bulk, do I have to come get a meter? How, how does that process? You're stating you're trying to get it to a point where they have meters. Are we going to have teeth in there that at some point, once we have meters, we see somebody going and taking water without a meter that we can that, find them? That would be a future step. Uh, what I see in some communities is where they'll have meters that can be checked out by a contractor, right. and they can go get the reading and then bring it back to City Hall. Or if they have a project going on all summer or something, or a longer period of time, they can check on a meter to keep it. 
and then when they bring it back in, at, you know, monthly or at the end of the project, then they get billed for all the water that they use. Uh, I've also seen times where they can still do estimates. Uh, we do ask that they tell us beforehand because if we do see somebody pulling up to a hydrant, filling up without the city, we're going to Public Works guys will be going up and saying, what are you doing? And uh, for any other recourses or that process, we're trying to, it, that would, that's a work in progress, Steve. That would, but that would be our next step if yeah. we want to get to that point. We don't have a lot of those meters yet, but like I said, that's a step of work in progress. Is there a challenge of getting those types of meters? Is it a cost to us? To They're very expensive. Yeah. You're talking a couple thousand dollars per <laughs> meter. So that, that's why it's, it's an investment. Well, they they do have <coughs> the most of it. So I mean, they, at least the one like in front of the, the elevator. So that is a metered location. So they are at least trying to collect some data. Yeah, for that for that one in front of the. The elevator that is a meter location, okay. but then I believe we only have one other meter that we bring out of or something. So that's where it's if, if over time we'd like to build that supply up where we have some meters that can be checked out by contractors, that way we get better readings so of okay. no energy usage. Uh, the other change with this unmetered service rates uh, would be that surcharge. We're trying to make everything consistent. Like I said, the unmeter would be based off of 6,000 gallon usage. That includes your surcharge. We go down from 13, I believe it is, to 760. It's just so that way we're consistent across the board. And then if the water rates do change, whenever they do change, that formula is still in place. It's based on the 6,000 gallons, so we don't have to come and call out those individual properties or you know, those properties or those impacted each time. Our overall goal is that they would all be meter locations, but Ideal. And if we had the opportunity in some of these locations to be able to get a bulk that feeds many, we would take that approach too. It would depend on the situation. Yeah. Yeah. Depend on the situation. If we could, we would. Yeah. We would at least we would, uh, we'd at least like to be able to meter how much is going into the area, but then how do you build that? that? We don't really have a good mechanism to then say, okay. Of this 10,000 gallons of usage in you know the month, <coughs> how much of it went to this property, this property, this property? Oh, no, no, that's what I'm saying. That would, so that, that's the challenge. We would turn them into a bulk user and say, yeah. you figure out how to charge okay. your customers of that bulk supply. Right. Okay. So sometimes you'll see that to where, uh, where like property will have multiple events, like a trailer park, for example. They'll have a meter pit. The trailer park overall is a bulk user, and they determine. They get their water bill, and they determine how to divvy it up, and they build their own residence accordingly. Any other questions on this board? Make a motion to approve. Second. Second. Proposed to water rates. Second. <coughs> second. All right. All in favor, say aye. <coughs> aye. Yeah, online billing payment option. So, so what this is for is addressing online billing payment options uh, for utility bills. Uh, right now, uh, this past couple or about two years ago, the city introduced being able to pay utility bill by credit card about a year and a half, two years ago. Uh, we use a, a company called Clover for that, where we have a three percent charge plus. Uh, additional, so it goes up a little bit more. Uh, I want to say it's just over three percent that we charge for that. Uh, there's a company called GovCard that North Coquitlam Cities has recommended for cities to consider. And what that does is it you can still pay by credit card utility bill. However, they reduce the cost a little bit. So if you have a bill that is under sixty dollars, it's one seventy-five. $1.75. And if you have a bill over $60, it would be a 3% charge. 
So it would be a little cheaper than what we charge right now. Also, if you want to be able to pay your bill through ACH, a one-time ACH payment, then over and over, that charge would be 175. We only offer ACH as automatic payment structure. So you have, if you set up automatic ACH, it would still remain free to offer residents. Uh, this also would make it to where a resident could pay their utility bill except online themselves. So they'd be able to interface on the city's website, click on there, enter in their account number, pay the bill, and they'd be covered. Uh, the advantage to this also is with this process with GovCard is that the city would not have to pay GovCard, they take their share right off the bat. Versus where how right now is every month we get a bill from over pay for how many credit card transactions we've had every month. So also, um, we do rent it or pay for a machine in Clover. Web card would be my saying it's pretty much computer based. We have a platform where somebody called in, want to pay their credit card, or if we you know, want to read it, to be able to pay in person. Uh, but like I said, they would also be able to pay for their bills online. A lot of other utilities that use this with electric, gas, you can pay your utility online with credit card or ACH. It's just giving more options for customers to be able to pay their bills online. Brent, did you say the auto pay too? Auto pay, we would be keeping that for the ACH. Uh, for the credit card, I don't know for sure if they would have that as an automatic payment for the credit card option. But for ACH, we maintain that, and that doesn't go through uh, through this gov card process. It will go through just our banking process that we use. So on the 25th, 26th, or every month, I believe it's around 25th, 26th is when we do the uh, draw. The 25th is when we do the draw, I believe, for ACH automatic payments. So we submit a draw to the bank saying the following counts. Here's how much they owe. And it processes it all in one transaction for us. Yeah. So what we're looking for is, since whenever we have rates or charges or anything like that, we'd like to bring the council to make sure that it's good with that. Here you got, and anything commits that to, you know, to our customers or anybody that's our lot bring the council and also let you know about this process. So we're looking for approval to move forward with the go card process. If we'll have that structure. Second. Okay. Can we make some motion? Okay. Favor say aye. Aye. Okay. 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 The last one I have related to water here is, uh, like I mentioned just a minute ago, about rates. If you have rates or charges like that, we prefer to bring them by council so you're aware of them. Uh, we've had a situation here recently, and it does happen on occasion, where we have a water meter. Uh, essentially blow up and how this occurred I'll you know, walk you through the situation was where we had a property where a water meter was installed the door wasn't shut it froze overnight blew up the bottom we're fortunate enough it didn't cause a you know, very big water leak and the individual caught it you know the next day they caught it before it could really cause a lot of damage to the property and everything it was a house being built um, but when a water meter does that, you have to provide them obviously with a new meter. You can't repair the one that blew out. If you find it has the bottom that pops out, that freezes or something happens, so it doesn't shoot water all over the place, it just shoots it down. Uh, but anyways, what we're looking for is our overall process when we have this, what we would like to do, and if you know, get the council policy on it would be to be able to charge cost of the meter plus 20% and trade costs. The reason behind the 20% is to cover our cost for public works time and admin and state hall staff where they have to go and program the meter and get it replaced back into the system. The cost of the meter right now, those meters cost about $160. So that 20% admin cost that's very high. It would, it would really cover about one hour of staff time between our public works guys. But like I said, they have to be able to go out there, check that it was installed, 
uh, also check the serial numbers, get that reprogrammed, get the meter reprogrammed, get it into our software so it reads correctly and they test it out. Uh, so there's a there's couple, there's typically about an hour or two of work. We got probably work staff and our utility to work that. Maybe a break even. Yeah, we're looking yeah, at basically break even. Maybe. So yeah, that's the overall goal. Maybe if it goes well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there was a different type of meter and it was more expensive. Then yeah. the 20% would be. So is this pretty responsible on a failure? Meter? Well, this in this situation, the meter actually it blew up from a situation where somebody did. They didn't. Uh, it's accidental. Yeah, it was accidental, but it wasn't it wasn't at the city's fault at all. But if there were a case where the meter failed. Yeah. And then it would that would be a warranty thing. Yeah, if there's a failure of the meter years. itself, that would warranty. Twenty years. Twenty years is yeah. the census I for was a twenty year warranty. Um, we also have so we have we run two different meters. We run the census I for all, and then we also have another one. Uh, the other one, I apologize, I don't remember the name of it. But it was uh, it, it costs us about four hundred, four hundred fifty dollars to sell the meter. So they're structured a little different, and the other meter is where we can actually turn off remotely. So we can turn flow off. control. Flow control. Yeah. So that's why we have that one is uh, where if we need to be able to do that, like if we don't have a curb stop that works or we have issues, we're able to do that meter. So that's why we say the cost of the meter plus the twenty percent. That way, if the meter is different price or different things, we're not coming back to you over and over. Is that a one question? Is that a change to the resolution then? So basically, what we're looking at is a resolution item to we state would, that this is a replacement cost. We would we would identify that on the resolution. Right, that's what I mean. So the fee resolution would list this item. Yeah. So I'll second that. Okay. Yeah. Second. So all in favor say aye. 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 Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, Mr. Mayor, Council. We'll just hit the highlights tonight. Uh, Maple Lake Estates, the project keeps continuing on. Um, still working on some storm sewer. It will be coming along 100th Avenue here in the next week or two, putting in the force main over to the Visco addition. That, that is not anticipated to be complete this year, Maple Lakes. They can't get time. The utilities out there and developer has um, decided to not push too terribly hard to, to get it to get it in this year. Um, been working on the water projects, the looping and the connection to Cass Rural Water Users. We are in our solicitation of views from public agencies, federal agencies, a period right now getting comments back from them. We are also preparing a um, I guess PowerPoint spreadsheet, PowerPoint slideshow for a uh, virtual public information. We're going to try that in this time of pandemic because there is a 30 day comment period on that um, presentation too. So we want to get that out, get that to people. Um, we've been doing a lot of these virtual public meetings with our DOT projects and they're actually getting better responses through the virtual than they were getting in person. So we're going to give it a whirl and see how these two, two projects work out. Um, Lost River is substantially complete. They are installing private utilities in there now. They did. I think they were within a day of their completion date on that one, so that looks good. Southdale Farms, the completion date is today. What work that remains out there now is um, sidewalks in the boulevard and some topsoiling around the boulevards, but they are working on that as we speak. Um, sidewalk two sidewalks are coming along. So I don't have a completion date on that one, but I anticipate in talking with field staff that this week is going to be very close by the end of the week, especially with the temperatures that we are potentially going to get. Uh, we've been working internally with Public Works and Administration and Finance on capital improvement projects for the next couple of years to get an idea of what the bigger projects are and the, the uh, funding that we can use for those. And we'll have a list at some point. Um, 81st Avenue got the last easement done today. He got that distributed to the landowner. Um, 
Lakeview and 63rd and 79th is slowly, but slowly, slowly progressing. We are up to $262,500 in liquidated damages. They have expended 128.9% of the project time, and they are 97% complete. There's punch list items remaining, and that's some other incidental stuff. We do have a meeting tomorrow afternoon on this project and path to final completion. But, um, yeah, they put their time on that. So. I can't believe it. I mean, they're not this close, and they aren't pushing to get that bucket up. I, that's why we're having the meeting tomorrow. Yeah. Officially got a nice week here. Yeah. And that's going to go down the hill next. Right. We're going to have an extension. Now to pay it, I mean. I just, 262 $262,500 on top of our retained uh, $606,285. <laughs> so we are retaining six, almost nine hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. Well, we can start by our eighty first. Is I'm sorry, not eighty second. No, it's eighty first still. It's still eighty first. Yeah. Okay. It, it changed his name, so that's. Right. We're going with just eighty first until someone replants more. So there's the plan going to be any construction on that? Just following it. Right. The plan is to still do the underground. Do all the underground and get, get as much of the underground as yeah. before freeze yeah. up. Yeah. And then the, the surface work, the road work, we need to start as early as possible next spring. Correct. Right. And we're working with the school and the adjacent landowners on the connector between Lakeview and uh, 81st. There was some schools interested in a land swap, and so was the developer, to make a little bit more uh, usable land for each other around the West side of the high school. So, yep. Yep. like something like uh, Southdale Farm, like you said, it's very close to completion. That's from the current contractor putting in the roads and that kind of stuff. But like you said, private utilities does that come after that? Private right? utilities comes after after, and uh, and the reason why is the. Private utilities can drag out for a longer time, and if the prime contractor is complete with their work, they still hold the roach control, and they hold cleanup on that as part of theirs, so they prefer to get it done, turn it over to the private utilities, and the private utilities have to, have to be responsible for that. So it's it's been a an issue on past projects, and we're hoping to work through some of that maybe this winter, but from what I've gathered in talking with other people within the metro, it's not specific to horse and it's nothing to me. It's just kind of a unfortunate work through type of thing. So, so Brent, I guess the question, just so I'm just trying to understand the process, understand, okay, you got to pay that. Do we start providing permits for the public utilities are done or do we not? So all of that is done. Start. Our, the stance right now is that we prefer to have the utilities in before a house could start being built. Um, that way, the con utility contractors aren't dealing with having anybody in their way. They can be the most efficient possible. Uh, take a loss or a fit, for example. Utilities are moving along pretty fast. Uh, they can move in really quickly if they don't have anybody in their way. So that's our overall preference historically before probably this summer. Uh, we haven't really had a hard stance, but like I said, our preference now is that the utilities are in as is, all possible. Is lighting, public light there? Is lighting, uh, lighting, is part of the lighting is installed as part of the local improvements, but that's put in under the construction contract. Okay. But there is a component of that to get the service to the light, street lights. Because that's one of the things that we've always held up is signage 
and lighting of the right of way before we've allowed the project to be substantially completed. It obviously has to be paved and seeded, and, and then it has to be lit, and the signage has to be in place for enforcement purposes, and it's a public safety too. So this time of year, it gets to be crowded in the local parks because different contractors are different, <coughs> working for different utilities, and sometimes they're there at the same time. So you told me to understand this when they come up to the farm. Most everything is done. Yep. Don't see lights yet, but maybe I can't see it because it's a power. <laughs> because of the, the feed point, yeah. Okay. Getting, getting the power to us. Okay. Thank you. Yes. The patching is complete. The streetlight patching, you saw the estimate here. We do have just the, we have to get the testing invoices from uh, the contractor for that. Um, There are still talks of more subdivisions for next year. We have a meeting tomorrow afternoon on Maple Lake Estate Second Edition, so there is still subdivision work on Lake Estate not next year. All right. Any other questions? That's all I got for you today. Okay. All right, Brandon, you're up. Okay. The the only update I have for you is just regards to building permit data to see you know where we're at for building permits. Overall for residential, we've had a total of 77 new residential dwellings and new houses, uh, 12 commercial properties, nine public, 16 accessories, and four foundation. Comes out to 118 uh, permits under the building for like the two structures. Uh, with remodels, we've had a total of 57. We've got three demolitions and one permit cancellation, which totals 179 total permits this year so far. So Keith has worked together a chart showing comparisons over the last four years, and you'll see this year it's just skyrocketed compared to the previous three to four. Um, but like I said, just giving you a comparison of that. Uh, we have not had a lot of other, you know, the new developments that are starting or not too far away from going online. South Dale, a lot of the uh, and Cub Creek really hasn't started moving yet. Uh, anticipate we may get a few houses going to developments before the end of the year, but not a lot. Uh, we, what we really think is next year that's going to take off because we're going to go up the first group to the bottom of the hill and be ready for move forward next year. They're also hoping that building supplies will be a little easier to get <coughs> maybe next spring. So that's the update. Okay. On portfolio updates, I guess I don't really have much other than it looks like people were out having fun on Halloween. I think all the kids are masked up. <coughs> so they had to some of their costumes are on their masks, which is so themed. <laughs> Pretty cute, so um so I know the governor's keeping an eye on this thing too, so He's watching as, as we go here with how you know, this is a uh, pandemic going on. So keep an eye on it, keep getting closer. John, you got anything? Dave? I guess the only thing I would state, Brent, right? We have made a determination to wait a couple of weeks on our engineer interviews due to some COVID concerns. So we'll be <coughs> trying to get some information. Okay. Yep. Nelson, what do you got? Thank you.